Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and welcome to JCB Live. We're going to be traveling from Napa Valley in our wonderful launch in Yonville, JCB Lounge, where I am, as you can see, our brand new table, Baccarat behind me, some amazing crystal and bottle of wine with a great friend of ours, a very close friend of mine of over two decades, dear friends. He's the epitome of wine. He's the symbol of entrepreneurship in the wine world, started in the wholesale world, then, of course, the restaurant consults for many, as well as the greatest hotels in the world. And he started an unbelievable operation as early as 24 years ago now. And it's Wine Watch, the best place to find one of the most, you know, allocated and sought after wines in Florida. He ships all over the US and around the world. I'm very pleased to introduce you, dear friends, Andrew himself. La Passoni! Where is John Charles? So good to see you, my friend. And uh, I don't know how you remember all this stuff. You know, we've known each other for such a long time. And you do this uh, on a daily basis. Of all the people that I know in the wine business, you have got more energy. And what you've created with this JCB Live TV is exactly what I wanted to do when I started Wine Watch TV. Well, uh, when I was night when I was 40, you know, and we both turned 40 the same year. We're both vintage 1969 and we go back over 25 years. My friend, I was working at uh, Republic National 1996 when we first met and we uh, had a lot of great times together back then. The American Lung Association used to put on this great charity event that you were so kind to be a part of for many years. And, uh, you know, I remember the dinner that we did together at this French restaurant, Le Bon Crepe. Uh, if you remember, we uh, you, you like you like to have fun with people, and you blindfolded the people, and you wanted to see if they could tell the difference between red and white wine just for fun. And you know what? Half the people couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Andrew, I I'm so excited, obviously, to be together and to celebrate, as you so kindly said, over 25 years of friendship. So. Let's get a toast as close as we can. Yes. Cheers, my friend. And I'm drinking out of your glasses, sir. You see, we've, uh, we've decorated the bar with a little swag from JCB here. Not only do you make some great wines, but this is also a lifestyle that you've created um, of JCB with uh, the glassware, the clothes, the accessories. I mean, like I said, what you've done just completely and totally amazes me. I don't know where you find the energy because I know that you don't do drugs. I mean, I've known you for that long to know JCB, this is him. He's not on anything except for 21. Hey, this is our drug, isn't it? <laughs> the best. Uh, wine is the best drug. You know, and they just found evidence, scientists did, that it kills the coronavirus. The tannins in red wine keep you from getting sick from the coronavirus. So you need well, to vaccinate. I've never seen you sick in 25 years. So I know you have a lot of wine on a daily basis from, do you still do breakfast, lunch, and dinner with wine? You know, you know what a meal without wine is called, JCB? It's a uh, breakfast. You know, I don't eat breakfast. I've got a book coming out called The Two Bottle Per Day Wine Diet. And there's not a lot of room for food in this diet. You know, you, uh, you have to give up breakfast. And another thing you have to give up is desserts. And to be able to drink two bottles of wine, I'm willing to do that on a daily basis. So, yeah, tell us about this amazing, so you're working on a book on a two bottle of wine per day. I love it. Well, you know, you know me for a long time. When I worked for a distributor, I used to do a lot of staff training and a lot of education with wine. So I started writing this book called The Wine 101, which was a training manual for restaurant staff. And then I started using it for yacht staff after I bought the store. And, you know, it's kind of evolved over the course of years. And I said, you know, no one's going to buy a book called Wine 101. How boring does that sound? But think about it. Everybody is on a diet today. And if you saw a book in the bookstore, the two bottle per day wine diet, ah, now you have my attention. <laughs> I want to see I this it. Is <laughs> hey, hey, I you weighed my myself. Attention. I've weighed myself for the last... 12 years now since I turned 40, and I've weighed 195 pounds. I've not gained a pound. I've not lost one, but I haven't gained one either. So the diet works. Well, in your diet, you have cheese as well? 
Cheese is very important, General Shells, because cheese is how your body creates vitamin D. Sunshine, as you notice the nice tan here, I get out in the morning by the pool with my dog and do yoga. And cheese is the other part of that with the sunshine is how your body creates vitamin D, which is another thing that's essential to keep yourself in good health. So, yes, so cheese is an essential part of everyday life for me. I love to hear that. So what cheese would you actually pair with the JCB21? Because I know you're a big fan of bubbles and you have bubbles at the beginning and the end of a meal. So give us your thought on the best pairing of this. Well, you know, I think uh, the kind of cheese that you find where they make the wine is a good start. So you know France very well, as that's where you're from, Burgundy. And Champagne, I'm sure they have a cheese that they have in Champagne. Um, yep. that indigenous to that area. I always say look for that cheese, but goat cheese is one of my favorites to pair with Champagne. That little tartness, that bitterness of the goat cheese goes very nice with a, a little sweetness that you get in most champagnes because you have a little sugar they add, the dosage to it. And this is not champagne, but you know, you guys do make some very good champagnes as well now at JCB. This is what I call, I mean, it's something, like I say, we have to have in the store because for everyday drinking, in this price range, you cannot beat this Cremant de Bourgogne. And I found out your little secret. When I was in France last year on the JCB tour, you guys get grapes from all over Burgundy and from Jura, which I didn't realize you can get grapes from Jura to make Cremant de Bourgogne, which creates a more complex wine. You are brilliant, my friend. What an explanation. And I love your idea of sparkling wine, Cremant and Champagne with goat cheese, fresh or even a little age. I think it's an amazing association. Now, Andrew, you know, you've been an enormous success in the world of wine. You have a thirst for knowledge. You're amazing because you read, you write, you compose, you have an amazing newsletter. Tell us from the beginning, what was your inspiration actually to get into the wine world? You know, JCB, I was working my way through college. I landed a job at a restaurant called Cafe Max. At that time, I wanted to save the world. I was studying chemistry and biology. I wanted to be an environmental scientist. I was big, a big surfer. I traveled around the world surfing the world's biggest waves I could find. And I realized after working for one year at Cafe Max and meeting some incredible people in the wine industry, uh, I said, you know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I really can't save it myself. I might as well drink the world's greatest wines. And I pursued a career in wine after that. And I think it was the right choice for me, you know? I mean, I'm not that smart. I drink for a living. Some people may argue that I am smart because I drink for a living, but it's been a great life. I've got to meet great people like yourself and got to travel all around the world. And tonight we're drinking some of the world's greatest champagnes. You know, in addition to uh, the retail operation, we do some incredible wine tastings. For me, my reason d'etre is not to sell the world's greatest wines, but to drink them. That's the reason I got this job. Tonight we have 1990 Cru Clos de Menil. If I had to pick my favorite champagne, Krug would be it. And even though the Clos de Menil is ridiculously expensive for them, I still want to drink it. I can't justify spending $2,000 of my own money on it. So we spread it around and we have a small group of people tonight that will share the wealth and share the cost of that bottle. And we have the oldest bottles of champagne that we have in the store on the table tonight. Because as soon as I get wines like that in, I immediately set one bottle aside so we can drink it and experience it, which is what life is all about, my friend. It's about I experience. Love, I love this um, energy and absolutely this willingness to open the bottle. Andrew, I'd love to for you to explain to us, you, you're you know, serial entrepreneur. You've done so many great things in your life. You started on the wholesale side. How did you decide to migrate into building this amazing destination that is Wine Watch, where everybody could enjoy the wines and as well buy them, collect them, and get your advice. Give us the progression of how you become an entrepreneur as you have with such success. Well, you know, I would never consider myself an entrepreneur, really. I think you're very kind when it comes to that. But, you know, I was in at the ground floor when the internet and the World Wide Web was just being introduced to commerce. And when I bought the store, well, I worked with a, a Jim Turner, who was a very well-known wine personality here in South Florida. He worked for the Wine News. I worked with him at Cafe Max. And uh, he found out he was fatally ill, so he pretty much gave me the store. Uh, you know, I did pay him for it, 
But I paid him eighty thousand dollars, and uh, you know, he wanted me to pay off his credit card debt. That's really all he wanted because he was a very noble guy. He didn't want to leave this world with any debt on his shoulders. So I transferred his eighty thousand dollars in credit card debt onto my ten credit cards at that time. I just had enough credit card uh, credit on my credit cards to pay off his debt. So it was very lucky, and it was kind of a risky thing to do because no one wants to have a hundred thousand dollars in credit card debt. And uh, at that time, the store was only doing $20,000 a month in sales. Uh, December was our big month. We did over half a million dollars in December. So I had to make it from May to December and be able to pay off all that debt until then. And it was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit scary the first year, but after I made it past our first holiday season, the rest was history. And we started to focus on the internet first. I knew that I couldn't open 10, 20 stores. I'm not that kind of personality. I don't like a lot of people in terms of, I don't want to manage people. The hardest yeah. thing you have to do, as you know, in business is manage your the people that work for you. So I said, I only want to have one store. I don't want to have a chain of stores. I don't want to have to drive around and worry about who's stealing from me at what store. So I said, we're going to focus on the internet. And this was uh, before wine.com. It was before any of the online retailers got started. A wine watch was the first retail store in the country to have live and real time inventory which really gave us a presence not only in south florida but all over the world and we started to get uh you know people taking notice of us on the internet at that early stage and then of course when i started wine watch tv on youtube youtube's owned by google so anything that we did a piece on you find us on google because of that and that's really how we got to be an international brand that's amazing. So tell us about this amazing turn into technology, because as we all know, as wine lovers, we typically are very behind this technological leap. So you were really one of the first one and Wine Watch TV is amazing. You, you were so kind to have me a few times on it. We've had so much fun. Tell us about that and how you do it and what are your goals within it? Because I know you have over 3,000 wines as a choice. I mean, it's mind boggling. Well, you know, I would say what you are doing is what exactly I wanted to do when I started Wine Watch TV, make it more like a wine variety show. And I'll tell you what, we had everyone in the store participate in it. My wife, uh, who was the chef here at the wine bar, we did a little spit called Tony's Treats where she would tell people about what food we were serving at various events. And then we'd have uh, one of our guys, I was trying to get the whole staff introduced, ask Ward, we'd ask him a difficult question. And he's funny because he always gives a one word answer. So, uh, you know, add a little levity and comedy into the show because people don't want to listen to you talk about wine the whole time, you know? They want to be entertained. And I think that's what you do really well. And, you know, get the family involved so people look at you and not only they recognize you, but they see you're a human being, they get to know your wife. I got my kids involved in it. You know, we have this one employee we call high school because I nickname everybody. And he started working here when he was in high school. So one of the bits we were going to do is, are you smarter than a first grader? So my kids, obviously, were going to ask high school difficult wine questions, or I was going to, and they were going to answer them correctly. But you know what? We raised good kids. They looked at me and they said, Dad, no, we don't want to do this to high school. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you, Andrew, one of my phenomenal memory. So, dear friends, you need to realize Wine Watch is a destination. It's not just a store at all. It's an amazing place. You can have beautiful bites, incredible wine by the glass. It's as well a destination to meet other people. And Andrew so kindly invited me with our friend Ken Hornline and Brigitte Cusimano and a few of us. We did an amazing dinner. Your lovely wife prepared it. And for all your guests, we were probably 40, 50 people on the lawn. And your kids were so adorable to help us serve. I will never forget it. That was a true family enterprise. No, and that is uh, what we try to really emulate here. We're not going to be the biggest wine store. We want to be the best wine store. And you have not seen the new spot yet. We moved from the dump across the street we're at for 35 years. And we have a new wine bar that we built everything by hand. You can see the label collage boards behind me, the tables we built out of riddling racks. And the next time you come into town, we have to have you here because I, you know what? People still talk about that event, you know, about this guy, Jean Charles Boisset, what a charming man he was, and how much fun they had. Like I said, that to me is what you get that so many people don't understand is people don't want to listen to you talk about wine the whole time, okay? That's boring. 
I mean, they want a little information about wine, but they want to be entertained. And you had everybody singing at the end of the night, which is so important to engage everybody and uh, everyone in the room, you know, you, you have eye contact with them and the ability to make everyone feel like they're important, which is not easy and not everybody has that Whoa. ability. And I try to do it. That's every, your ability. Look at what That's your talent. Are, <laughs> and I have to say, that is one of the most important things when we have an event here to make everybody feel like they're involved with the event. Well, and that's your talent. So, Andrew, as we're serving the white from the Loach, the out fucking standing wine of the Loach, the OFS, as you know, uh, I think we should do a little bon bourguignon because we're going to bring somehow the energy of the old world to the Russian River. So let's do it together. Hands up. Okay. I know you're already on the red, but that's okay. We'll do white and red. Un, deux, trois. La, 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 You've made it such a success at Wine Watch because I really want everybody to hear how an amazing ambassador, promoter, an extension to the cellar and the wineries for all of us who make wine, you are the absolute very best because you pay attention to wine, you understand wine, you're very fun and you know your guests as well and their sellers. But give us the success of 38 years of amazing wine curating as you do you know jean charles nobody has given me a run in south florida you know when total wine opened up people said what are you going to do total wine is coming to town and i said you know we're a small boutique wine store total wine is a big liquor store you know what they have a lot of wines in there but they don't have the same kind of knowledge when you walk in there as the people that work at wine watch and when people come into wine watch the first thing i ask them is when they ask me for a recommendation it's what do you like I don't start taking them over to this wine that I need to sell that I'm making a commission on. And I think that honesty is something you don't see in many parts of the wine business, especially in retail. A lot of people sell you what they need to sell. And we try to find things that people are going to truly enjoy. And I always downsell people at first. They'll come in, they want a $50 bottle. I'll give them a $25 or $30 bottle and I'll say, try this. It's as good as a lot of the $50 bottles. And they appreciate that honesty, which, like I said, it's very hard to find in the retail world of sales today, not just in the wine world, but in any part of the retail world. So we try to and over deliver. Over deliver, which you do. Andrew, tell us about your view of the evolution of taste in America, because you've been for almost 40 years yourself promoting wine since the age of 10 or nine years old you've been promoting <laughs> wine i know that because we're the same age and oh. tell tell us about where you you've seen people over the last several decades and now you know where they're going in terms of type flavor profile collection give us your view you know i think things come full circle that's one of the weird things about life you know what we start as a kid and we like candy. So the sweet wines kind of appeal to me. When I first started drinking wine, it was white Zinfandel, you know, a Rio Nidi on ice, that's nice. And uh, today you're starting to see, you know, even though the fine wines of yesteryear were sweet, you're starting to see that sweetness come back in a lot of wines today, commercial wines, because when you're just getting into wine, even though, you know, you may be a little older, you still like those things that are very fruit driven. So, you know, the progress of taste starts at sweet, and then over time, it goes to dry and more serious. Uh, and you know what? We try to cater to people who like more serious wines, but we still have those entry-level wines that have a lot of forward fruit to them. You know, I remember when Deloche was started, Cecil Deloche, uh, we had him in a Cafe Max for wine dinners, and uh, yep. he started that as a retirement project. Here's a fireman that, you know, from San Francisco that started a vineyard as a retirement project, and then it just blew up. It became one of the most successful wineries in California. And he's very lucky to have you guys come in and take it over because a lot of companies that take over wineries like this that are successful uh, really screw them up. You know what? Uh, they don't really have respect for what the prior people did. One of the things I love about when you buy a winery, it's not about changing it to a JCB property. It's about respecting the integrity of what they started with and then growing upon that. So the OFS, 
their finest stuff, our finest shit, as Cecil used to say. Still a part of the program. We'd love to see that. And then you got a lot of new stuff which appeals to the masses in this, but you've always respected what they started in terms of the fine wines that were created at Deloach. Well, thank you so much. Well, this is a great uh, compliment to the Deloach family. Now, Andrew, tell us about your process when you meet guests for the first time, you serve them a glass of wine, and you advise them to collect wine, build, a, build an assortment for their home. Give us your perspective of, of how you do things, because I really want people to get a flavor about how talented and amazing you are as an advisor, a curator. And I love what you've said earlier along the same line. It's not always about selling the most expensive bottles. It's really taking them through, you know, all the different moments of wine. You know, I think the important thing about collecting wine is you buy wines that you like. And your taste changes every seven years. So you don't want to buy so much wine that you're going to have it for, you know, over 10 years unless, I mean, you like old wines. The only way to so really why have seven it, years, by the way? Yes. Every why seven, seven years? years? That's, that's just what they say. They say that your taste changes every seven years. And you don't want to buy too much of any one particular wine. For okay. instance, I used to really like Red Zinfandel. Red Zinfandel, to me, doesn't age very well. So, you know, you don't want to buy a lot of Red Zinfandel and put it aside uh, because 10 years from now, you're not going to be able to drink it probably. And uh, you're probably not going to be able to sell it either. You know, collecting wine is something, if you want to have a lot of wine, you want to buy things that you're going to be able to have value in uh, when they get to be mature. You don't want to buy things, like I said, unless you're going to drink all of it, that you're going to have 10, 20 years from now that don't, don't still have value in terms of they're drinkable or they have commercial value for sale. So I always say you want a mix of both of those things. You know, like your top burgundy brand, Domaine de Vougery. If I'm buying Burgundy, I'm going to buy a couple bottles of Grand Cru Vougere for my seller because those wines over time are going to go up in price. They're going to appreciate in value, and you're going to be able to drink them. We have a Burgundy tasting yep. next week featuring wines from the 1960s. We just got in this huge collection of wine from the I'm 60s, coming. including our vintage 1969. And um, you know what? We have to taste them, A, to make sure they're good. And B, it's a great way to sell them, to pop the bottles to see if people are going to like them. I never recommend you buy old wines unless you try them because old wine is an acquired taste. And uh, you don't want to have a bunch of old stuff just because you want old stuff in your cellar. You at least want stuff that you're going to enjoy if and when you do pop the bottles. Well, that's a great perspective. Give us as well your view of collecting in general, acquiring amazing bottles of wine and building kind of an uh, iniquity within your cellar. You know, the most important thing about uh, buying wines to collect is you have a place to put them. You know, the first thing I did when I bought the store was I created a wine storage business because a lot of people have more wine in their house than they have room in their cellar to put the wine in. So you need to have off-premise storage if you have a fair amount of wine. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. You don't want to keep them all in your house. What if uh, a natural disaster should happen? You don't want to potentially lose everything. So I always say you want to spread out your eggs. You don't want to put them all in one basket. So we have storage where we keep a lot of our customers' wine. It's always been full. We've never advertised it. It's just been a service that we've offered to our good customers. And you know what? We've been lucky. Everybody pays. Wine bottles are the best tenants to have. They don't complain about the bathroom being broken or about anything being wrong, you know, and they pay their bills on time. Otherwise, we drink them. So it's been a great addition to the business, and it's also helped our customers uh, acquire more wine and have it stored properly so when they do want to sell it, they can check it out of storage. And I can tell you another thing. It's also helped their marriage situation. Because they don't have to listen to their wife complain every time a box of wine comes to the house. She doesn't go out and buy a new pair of shoes. What? Another case of wine? I'm going shopping. I can't believe you bought more wine. So we've helped people with their marriages as well. And, and vice versa, because I think you have a lot more ladies at the wine bar as well, collecting wines, buying fine wines. I understand you have a very large group now. You know, we do not discriminate. We've always been, uh, you know, willing to take on all comers here. We don't look at people in terms of, you know, their gender, their race, 
we look at them about, and look at their passion for wine. That's the only thing that's necessary to be a customer of the Wine Watch. You know, we've always been open, and we don't have enough ladies. You know, for some reason, it is a male-dominated uh, sport, collecting wine. I would yeah. say we're about 80-20 in our storage with men to women in terms of stores. Well, we're going to change that over time because we have a lot of ladies watching you, and they're going to be charmed, and they are already charmed by your style. Now, <laughs> Andrew, just to come back on style, I'd love for you to give us you know, you're in, in the southeast of the United States, in one of the most booming state in the country and in the world, really, um, you have a big group of South American, Central American, Europeans. So you're very different than the mainstream of the U.S. Where do you see flavor profile and taste evolving with food? And where do you see overall style going? You know, this is a very unique market because we have people from all over the world. We have a huge amount of people from South America. Uh, Brazil is one of our biggest uh, markets. So that has been completely shut off, obviously, during the pandemic because they're not allowed to travel here. But we still are in touch with our friends from Brazil. They love the classics. They love Bordeaux. They love Burgundy. But we want to turn them on to new things. So I turn them on to French wine, to Italian wines. Uh, I turn them on to California wines and new things. And they're always willing to experiment. The people in Brazil love wine and they love trying new things, even though they stick to the classics. If Florida was a country, we're the number one country in the world for Argentina and Chilean wines. So we have a huge demand here for wines from South America, which is unique, I think, to South Florida uh, uh, in the country. And then Spanish wine, because we do have a, a fair amount of Spanish-speaking people here. Uh, Spanish wine is pretty big here in South Florida as well. But you know what? We still sell more California wine than anything else in terms of bottles. The dollars with collectibles are in the French wine, as you know. Yeah. You know, there's nothing that comes close to the French collectible. How, how many friends here in the chat are asking, how do we get to be Andrew and have an amazing selection of over 3,000 wines? How, what's your process of wine selection? wine tasting, wine evaluation. I know you're a judge on, on many competitions as well. I mean, you're part of so many great things. Give us your process of, of how you learn about so much and you can remember so much. Well, champagne is good for your cognitive um, thinking process. You know, they've proven, <laughs> scientists, that champagne, because of the way it's made, helps your cognitive functions of your brain. So I am going to go with the fact that I drink champagne every day, helps me remember wines. And you know what, JC, you remember things you, that are important to you. And I take notes. I've been taking notes on wine for 25, 30 years now. And, uh, you know, I think that helps you remember things, too. When you, you have a scientific process that you go through when you're evaluating things. And not only do I take notes about the wines when I taste them, I keep all the wines that I taste till the second day and I retaste them again. And a lot of people think, well, what do you mean? You, you keep this wine, this glass till the second day? Yes, I put a cover on top of it, and I come back when I get in the next day because your palate is the freshest before you've eaten anything, uh, before you've drank anything, and I retaste the wines, and I'll tell you, that has been the single greatest thing that I've done to the tasting process, is tasting things again the second day. Because I found the great wines, like the OFS Pinot, going to be better on the second day that it's open. That's why I don't believe in these Coravin things. And not only do we as wine merchants want to sell you more wine, but I also want to see what the wine tastes like the second day after it's had a chance to open up. And all great wines are better on the second day, in my opinion. And if you can't get to them by the third day, hey, my little piece of knowledge that you're going to take to the bank with you today, put them in the freezer, man. Freezing wine is the best way to preserve it. Yes, it tastes like the day that you put it in the what? freezer. You don't need that Coravin thing. That's the worst thing that's happened to wine. I'd like to say that we could have probably sold a, a million dollars worth of Coravin since they came out. But you know what? I don't believe in it. I don't sell things I don't believe in. Everybody has a freezer. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but it works like a charm. I can't tell you how many times I've done it. I'm going to start doing it. Uh, it, it's it's not obviously not with champagne, not with bubbles. You can't freeze the bubbles. No, you know, um, yeah, because you lose the bubbles. But other than that, your Delosio FS of uh, Pinot Noir, uh, your high end wines that you know you, you may want to experience them, and you may be leaving town 
uh, put them in the freezer if you can't get to them in three days. And then a canter. Uh, Here we the go, baby. Is my favorite, man. I'll tell you what. I mean, I like the red wine decanter, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you. This is a unique thing. Nobody has this. This is a thing. If you love champagne, everybody should have it. And I'm going to use it tonight with my 1992 Claude de <laughs> Hey, can you send me pictures? Because as you know, Andrew, you know the story. We were together in Florida when we launched it, you know, in this amazing house. And you had many of your friends coming. You know, for everyone to know, Marie Antoinette was the, really the first one in the Gallery of the Mirrors in Versailles to eliminate the bottle because of the look. Everybody grabbed the champagne because nobody wanted, she didn't want to have a green bottle on the bottle, on the table, and it was a huge success. So I'm so glad you love the champagne decanter. And I'm with you, you know, I'm very big into natural oxygenation of, of a wine. So do you recommend, Andrew, to use a lot of decanters as well, rather than just purely those accelerating systems to age wine artificially? Well, you know what? I always say we're doing scientific work with wine, so our, our normal decanter here is much more simple than, uh, than this. This is what we use here on a daily basis. I like it. Some, sometimes we'll have 20 or 30 of these lined up on the bar for happy hour and for a tasting we do every Saturday called Brown Bag. So, you know, this is what scientists use. This is what we use here at the Wine Watch. As I said, we're doing scientific work with wine. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, I'd love for you for, for uh, a few minutes to tell us what really inspires you every day to be, we, we've been knowing each other for a quarter of a century, 25 years. We born the same month, almost the same year. I've adored you literally for 25 years. And when I lived in France, we didn't see each other as much. You are the same phenomenal ebullient personality, flamboyant, charming, knowledgeable person that I've known 25 years ago when you and I were holding a wine bag and calling on a restaurant together. And I will never forget the great discussion and you had a dream. What inspires you to be so phenomenal all the time, so on, such in a great mood? Give us, give us your world. You know, Jean-Charles, when you find something that you really enjoy doing, it's not like work. And I'm here seven days a week. I truly love putting experiences together. And I've had customers come in and they've become really good friends. And yeah. then they not only with, with me and with the Wine Watch, but with other people that they've met at our events. And to me, that is what makes me work hard when people come in and I see the friendships and the, uh, uh, the the relationships that we've built over the course of years, and it all focuses around one thing. It all focuses around the love of wine, and it's great to put people together because after you found out that they love wine, then you, they find other things that they have in common. Tonight, after we, you know, we have a small tasting tonight because uh, for whatever reason, tomorrow night we're sold out, Saturday night we're sold out, and with our COVID restrictions, we only have 16 people. Even though we're allowed to be open at 100%, we're still trying to make everybody feel safe. And with one bottle, 16 people is uh, as much as you can do anyways. But I have people that come in and they'll say, Andrew, I remember that tasting that you did 20 years ago. That's the right. Of Petrus, back to 1964. And the 64 was out of half bottles and it was absolutely amazing. So I think that is one of the things that makes me work harder and continue to push the envelope for what we do in terms of tastings people that come to our events really appreciate it and they remember it. It creates memories for them that last a lifetime. I love it. And um, we have something big in common together is to love sharing. Would you give us your definition of sharing? You know, life is short and I think people want to hold on to their dearest uh, bottles of wine. They, they want to you know, wait for a special occasion. And I think every day above ground, this is something that we should have learned from this pandemic is a special occasion. Every day that you have the right person in the room that's going to appreciate that bottle of wine is a reason to open it. There is no reason to hold on something that is here and that is great just because you want to continue to have it because you want to experience it to me. That is what life is about. And you want to have that memory of it, sharing it with that person 
And like I said, that years from now, hopefully, we're still around and we'll have that memory together. That's the most important thing about anything great in life, wine or otherwise. So well said. What is, um, Andrew, your dream? A dream, obviously, that you haven't yet accomplished because you've accomplished so much in the world of wine and friendship and sharing and bringing people together. What is another dream you wish to share that you haven't yet done and you wish to achieve? Ah, you know, the only thing that I want to continue to do is to travel the world and share these experiences with other people. We had our friend Jose Luis from Barquita Riscal here a week ago, and we sold out the whole Frank Geary Hotel one night uh, to our group that was here. And sharing experiences like that where you're traveling and uh, having a, a, a trip that you, know, you have wonderful wine experiences, food experiences, and culture and history, to me is one of the things that I love in addition to food and wine. And uh, that is the next phase for the Wine Watch. We're going to start a serious campaign to do some traveling with our wine drinking people and continue to see the wine world and experience new things like your uh, winery in India is on my list. I've never been to India. One of the things I love about Jean Charles is you're continuously experimenting and it doesn't seem like you're slowing down at all, my friend. I mean, never. India, what is next for JCB? Where are we going <laughs> next in the world of wine? Well, you know, I'm so glad you say that because you do meditation on a daily basis. You're one of the most centered wine men that I know. Give us your routine of meditation in the morning. You said you do it. You enjoy a lot of wine. You eat well. You've maintained the same weight for 20 years. Tell us about that meditation that you do as, as something we should do as well. Well, it starts at night. I'm going to tell you one of the things I learned this year is melatonin is one of the most important things for your body. It's a hormone that your body produces naturally, but when you get to be our age, you produce less than a tenth that you produce when you were a teenager. So they found out that uh, people that take melatonin have a 30% less chance of getting sick from the coronavirus because you sleep better. So you need to get eight to ten hours of sleep a night. I know you don't get eight or ten hours Not of sleep. Much. Hours Are you eight out of ten. your mind? Ten yes. hours? Yes, eight to ten hours. That's important. And I'll tell you what, I wake up the next day and I drink uh, uh, two liters of water in the form of herbal teas. I have okay. various herbal teas I drink. And as I'm going through my emails and doing that, I get a little work done. And then I go outside and do my yoga by the pool my stretching exercise, I do cardio, I do strength training. I've wow. been working out twice as much since this pandemic started. I feel great. I'll tell you what, the, the melatonin is something that's new. Uh, the double workout has been you know, something I've been working out my whole life, but I've, dub I've doubled it up just to stay extra healthy. And those two things, by the time I get to work at 2.30 in the afternoon now, because I'm partially retired, I feel great and I'm ready to start drinking wine again. That is my secret, buddy. You're going to wow. sweat out some of the alcohol and plenty of sleep. I'm going to call you for common meditation very soon. <laughs> <laughs> very impressive. Well, Andrew, what a fun time together. You're such an inspiration. And on that note, what inspirational message would you want to share to all our friends watching you right now? You know, when I started doing Wine Watch TV, I think you need to have an opening line and a closing line. My closing line is, remember, always drink the good stuff first. I love it. Well, Andrew, we cannot wait to obviously physically see one another and do another event. So remind everybody about Wine Watch, where they should go, so everybody can follow you as well on your fantastic YouTube because as you know, I dialed in very, very often and I'm so, I could be on a treadmill, I could be in the car, I love to listen to you talking about wine. So give us all the clues for everybody to follow you. Well, it's simple. You Google Wine Watch and Wine Watch comes up on the front page of Google. We have 4,000 videos on YouTube, Instagram TV, and I try to review every tasting we do at 3.30 live the next day. So I will let wine people know it couldn't make the tasting tonight, 
what the crowd's favorite champagne was tonight, tomorrow at 3.30. And every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we've got world-class events going on. So the following day at 3.30, I review all the tastings and tell everybody, not my opinion, not just my opinion, but what the entire crowd that night picked as the wine of the night. Because people's opinion matters, you know? We like to get a consensus. When you have people in the room that are passionate about wine, we want everyone to know what the entire group felt, not just what my opinion was. Fantastic. Well, Andrew, great, great time together. I know I took a good 40 minutes of your time, but this was so exciting. And I got to tell you, as your friend of 25 years, to look at the last 25 years together, knowing each other, being friends, to witness your amazing success. And, and what I would like to say, besides your business success, your family success, all your circle of friends that I love, and to see where you are today from your meditation to your mind to who you are, I'm very grateful and feel very honored for us to be friends. So thank you so much, Andrew. John Charles, the same love goes out to you, my brother. It's been a wild ride, and I hope to know you another 25 years, my friend. Hey, I just got a shipment right here in Napa Valley of a lot of 69 from Burgundy, so I'm waiting for your visit. When are you uh, coming? <laughs> you know how to get me out of the house. You know how to get me out very soon, as soon as I can, my friend. Well, we cannot wait. And last time, dear friends, when Andrea and I celebrated our 69, he brought an amazing wine from the Piemonte region from 1969, which was insane. And I know we're going to share many. So, Andrew, to your birthday and mine. Cheers, my brother.